Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Hey. Hi. Okay. So today we're going to be going over to, um, kind of an intro to Firebase and what you can do with it with your Android platform. So a little bit about me. I am an Android developer out in the area, um, Boulder, Denver area. Um, I do tutorials on the side for Tuts Plus, so I do that a couple times a month. I uh, also wrote a Android TV book through APRESS, did a 55-page white paper on Firebase, which is where all this content is going to be coming from. Um, Google Plus is pretty much where I post anything that I do to work on. I also have a GitHub here with uh, a few dozen just different demo projects through Android. So if you want to check out different things that I worked on, it's all there. Uh, it's just real sample stuff with tutorials that go with it, so you can work with that. Uh, so the first question we're going to go over is, what is Firebase? And Firebase itself is basically a backend as a service. Uh, so they break it up into three different parts. So you have develop, grow, and earn. So the develop portion of it is that you can basically get your apps built out fairly quickly without needing to have a backend developer building out things for you, for like a database, file, fire, uh, file storage, and so forth. Grow is to get more people using your app, because if no one's using your app, there's no real point to it. And then fancy ads for your earning portion. So they actually break all of these down into the different components that are there. So you have things such as the real-time database, authentication, cloud messaging, and so forth that are part of the develop branch. Um, Grow is going to be notifications, app indexing, other things for people to find your app and actually get it installed. And then earning, again, is just fancy ads. So before you can actually start on the um, Android part of it, you need to go ahead and create your project. So you can go into the Firebase console and create your project. It's fairly simple. You just give it a name. Um, I'd made one for GGG Boulder just the other day, so we can actually have a test project there. Once you have that, you need to add your Android app. So you give it your package name, you give it a nickname, and you can put in an SHA1 key so that you can actually reference it back to your apps that you have on the store, your debug for authentication, and other things that need to talk to the service. Uh, once you have done that, it'll generate a Google Services JSON file, which you'll need to put into your project so that it can actually reference everything correctly. And then because uh, Firebase is built on Google Play services, you will need to add the dependencies in your project level Gradle uh, for Google services, and then add the plugin as well for your module. And once you have that, you can include the different dependencies that you need for whichever portion of Firebase that you need. So anything such as the database or storage and whatnot will be all broken down into their own modules. So you're not importing the whole thing, uh, just like they broke down Play services not too long ago. Um, so once you have that, um, some things such as database and storage will need to have security set up for them. So you will need to uh, enable the Firebase Rules API, uh, at least for storage. I'm not completely sure on database. I don't think you need to have this API enabled for that. But it's easy enough to go through the uh, API console and just enable that. Once you have that, you can set up your rules for your real-time database or Firebase storage. Uh, so for this example, I just said if they're authorized or unauthorized, they can go ahead and use anything, just to make it real quick for an example. Obviously, any real apps that you have, you're going to want to have uh, it set up for your own rules and whatnot, depending on what you're doing. So the first component we're going to talk about is the real-time database, which, as you would expect, gives you real-time data access. Um, you're able to also have offline persistence for upload and download. So if you try to upload data and you don't have internet connection, it'll handle storing that for you. And the next time your user does have connection, it'll go ahead and upload it for them. Um, and then with downloading, if it is already downloaded before and it can't get a connection, it'll use whatever it has cached, and then it'll use it again later. And the way the database is set up is it's a NoSQL database. So you're basically given a JSON tree that you can work with, and you can access different portions of it that way, rather than having a relational database where you can run queries and so forth that way. So the data types are pretty standard. You have uh, floats, strings, ints, booleans, maps of objects, and lists of objects. Um, it kind of has arrays, but not quite. What it does is it takes the index and uses that as the individual key for that object so that it can sort it out that way. Um, arrays get a little bit tricky with the way it works just because you're pulling data in and out and changing it around so much that the indexes don't quite work out that way. Um, you can break your things into different groupings. So you can have different objects in different groups, and then you can just access what you need rather than pulling down everything all at once. Uh, you can also create a metadata node, basically, so that you can check what you need as you're going along with it. Uh, so your best bet is just keep your data kind of simple and flat, just so it's easy to access and you know where everything is, and you're not pulling down too much data. Because if you have 16 layers and you pull the top one, you're going to be pulling down way too much that you may not need. So this is an example of what that data would actually look like. So here I just created a jokes node and then put in jokes 0, 1, and 2. And then they just have a question and answer for each of them. So if you wanted to access joke number one, you could do that. And it would just pull down that one object. Um, 
and then you actually have a value event listener. So if those objects do change on you, you can go ahead and get a event that you know, oh, hey, this question just changed, and so you can update your UI and so forth based off of that. Now, likewise, you have the child event listener. So if anything in your data structure changes, you'll be able to access that, and you'll know when uh, something is removed or add or moved or so forth, just so you can keep working with it as you go along. Then you can add data, which is pretty straightforward. You just need to get a uh, reference to whichever place that you want to actually put that data on. And you create your object, and you just say, uh, from this database reference, here's the child that I want to put in, put in the key, and then you can upload that value uh, using the set value object. And it is, it'll have a uh, mapping method that you would use within your object to actually have it placed up there correctly. Same idea goes for updating. So you would just create a map, which will map your uh, keys to your object, so string to object. Then you put in your keys, you put in your joke, um, and here it'll just have your mapping object so that it actually know which values are going to go to which data values, or which keys to values. Uh, if you have data that's constantly moving around, you don't necessarily want to number your keys as you're going, so you may want to have just a unique key for whatever you're pushing up. So what you can do is you can actually use the push method and then have it get a key, return that, and then you can use that key to uh, push up any of the data that you're going to put up there so you're not overriding anything that's there and having any kind of conflicts. And then the last thing that we're going to have out of the real-time database is transactions. So if you have multiple people accessing one area and you don't want to overwrite any of that data, uh, you can use a transaction. So what it'll do is it will check to see if it can push up the data, see if there's any kind of conflicts. If there's not, it'll push it. Otherwise, it'll keep trying until they can push up data without a conflict, just so that you're constantly updating one key without uh, overriding anyone else's work on it. So the next thing we'll go into is file storage, which is the probably the second biggest use, I would say, out of it, um, other than the core stuff. So what you can do is you actually have a file store up on Firebase, so you can manually upload everything um, using just that upload file button that you see in the top corner. Um, this is where anything you upload from your app or anything that you manually upload will all end up in. So you can create folders, you can upload individual files, so forth as you're going along. Uh, so this is an actual example from Android Things. I ended up uploading stuff from one of those devices, but you can also upload manually to it, and this is where everything will kind of end up. Um, so you have a couple different options for how you're going to upload your data. So if you want to upload as bytes, you can create your storage reference uh, from the URL for that file storage URL, which you'll see at the top of it, um, which you'll actually see at the top of manual upload. It's right there, that gs colon slash slash, and then the link there. Uh, so you'll create that, and then you'll add the child for the file object that you want to throw up there. Um, then you take your bytes, and you can upload using, or I'm sorry, this is download, <laughs> uh, using get bytes. So it'll bring that down once you've pointed to what you're looking at. And then you have a success listener and a fail listener. So as things uh, succeed or don't succeed asynchronously, you'll be able to know what's going on with them. Uh, likewise, you can pull down full files. So here we at the top, we have an example where I just create a temporary file, and it's pulling down a file based off of the storage ref location. And then also using that storage ref, you can use the git download URL to receive the URL that you would use. So if you have Glide or Picasso or anything else of that sort, if you just want to use it as an image or anything else that you want to do with that code, you can just use uh, .git download URL. And then when that succeeds or fails, you'll be able to use the same listeners to find out what it should be. Uh, so here, just kind of a general idea of, hey, as you download, you can take that image. I just ended up grabbing a icon for GDG Boulder and threw it into an image view. So as it was being pulled down from file-based storage, it was put into this. Um, uploading is the same exact idea. So you have memory uh, byte arrays. So you can go ahead and just upload those using an upload task uh, from storage ref .put bytes. It'll return that upload task, which you can also associate a failed or success, success listener with. Um, it'll return snapshots and whatnot, so you can also see what's going on with that and what kind of data you're passing back and forth. Uh, you can also upload a file just like we did with downloading, <coughs> or you can use an input stream. So it really just depends on what kind of data you have and where you're getting it from for how you're going to pass it back and forth between file-based storage. Um, on top of that, when you have your upload and download task, you can pause, resume, and cancel. So you're not stuck with just, oh, hey, I fired it off, and now I've got to wait for it. If something goes wrong, you can actually handle each of those situations depending on what contingencies need to be handled. You can also um, give it custom metadata. So if you need to put any kind of data on your files that you're uploading to file-based storage, you have that all covered and taken care of. And then you can delete files that are already up there. So once you already have the reference to it, you can just say reference.delete and get rid of it from your file-based storage. You're not taking up room that doesn't need to be there. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to go over is authentication. And it's complicated. 
So <laughs> that's kind of the flow of what you need to pay attention to for smart locks and so forth. And I'm not really going to get too into the details for authentication, uh, just because it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> There's a ton of contingencies and so forth that you need to handle. Um, so Google does provide providers. So you can either use an email and password using your own custom stuff, or you can use Google login, Facebook login, Twitter, um, and GitHub, which I've actually never used the GitHub one because not many people use it other than developers. Um, so once you have that, you can have your users authenticate through whichever service. So here we actually have a Google provider that has put in a user, and they are given a UID. You can see, see uh, when they were created, when they were last logged in, what their email is. Uh, you can do things such as reset their passwords, delete the user, all that kind of stuff. Uh, once you have a user up and your user is logged in, you can use the auth uh, instance, so Firebase auth, and then you can get the current user. Um, and then you'll be able to see pretty much any of the information that you have on the back end there. So if you just want to display your user's image and their name and email and so forth to them in like a user profile page, you can do that. Um, here I'm just using Glide to actually use the put in the player or a person image. So it's all coming from a URL, so you can just use Git photo URL and so forth. So just a quick example, that's what that code does. It just throws general information and image up there. Um, you can also update that information that's up there. So if somebody has a Google account that has their real name and you don't want them to use their real name or they want to use their real name, they can update that. So any kind of name that they want to use, they can upload if you give them that permission. So you would just create a user profile change request, uh, set whatever information you want to have, and then uh, call update profile. And that'll have completion listeners so you can see if it was successful or not. Uh, so since we've already covered the UI database, or the database, the storage, and Authentication, they, Google has actually put out a third-party library. I don't know if you call it third-party, but it's a library. Uh, Firebase UI library, which basically covers all three of those and some of the more common tasks, just to make your life a lot easier so you're not manually doing all of this. Uh, so it's actually available for Android, iOS, and web, though last I checked, web only supports uh, authorization. It doesn't handle all the database and storage stuff. Um, so with the database, you're given a list view and recycler view adapter, which will automatically handle any kinds of changes to your data and updating what you're displaying on the screen, so you don't need to actually constantly listen to that value change and then update your stuff manually. Um, authentication, which is really big because, as we saw, authentication is really difficult. Uh, so they handle all the contingencies for you and will make it work. And then for storage, they just recently added this in end of October, I believe. And what they have is a uh, listener so that it will load images for you into an image view based off of the files that you have online. So for authentication from email, all you have to do is call authui, get instance, create sign in intent builder, and launch that with start activity uh, for result. And it'll go ahead and launch a custom UI uh, from that library that'll allow the user to enter in their username and their password and other stuff so they can create an account or log in. So this is actually the screen that they'll give you, and then I just use the uh, standard default styles, but you can custom override all of that with colors and whatnot for it. Uh, and then if you want to use providers, they actually provide that as well. So you can use the auth UI IDP config. You pass in the providers that you want to use, and then you can start another activity for result using that once it's created and you pass in the array of your providers. So here I just use the Google ones. There's nothing too complicated with it. So it allows the user to select which account they want to use, and then it'll just let them run through the standard uh, login process to say, hey, we will allow this for this app. Um, once everything has gone through, you can get a result on an uh, on activity result to see if it was successful based off of the signing code that you passed to it, and then handle whatever your situation is as soon as they're logged in. So if you had an event that you wanted to start off once they've logged in, you can handle it. If something fails, you can let the user know. Uh, as for the database, they do create the uh, Firebase Recycler adapter, which you can use. All you really need to do is pass in your data model and a uh, new view holder. And then you can associate the data through that. It'll bind it all for you. And then everything will just kind of update. Um, standard data holder where you just say, hey, here's my view. Here's the views that are within it. Here's how I want to associate it based off of whatever data I'm going to get, um, whatever's going to be called once the data is received. Um, let's see here. And then for the storage, all it does is they have this one real quick helper method, which will load images into your image view. Uh, so analytics is pretty much where everything in Firebase revolves around. So anything, uh, any kind of events and so forth will show up in analytics uh, from the stock stuff. You can also create your own events. You do have a really handy console that will show you what's going on with it, what's available, um, just kind of follow what's going on with users. 
any kind of events that you want to have. So it's the standard Google Analytics moved into Firebase. Um, they just kind of jump that service over. So again, they have stock events such as app exception, app removed, first open, anything with notifications. And then you can add your own, such as the uh, select content view item, which I added. Um, so you just keep track of events that are happening as your users are using your app. And then it'll show up in your console so you can kind of have easy to view graphs as you're going along. Uh, so if you want to record your own custom events, you basically will just create a bundle, put in your different parameters and content types and so forth, and then you'll call Firebase Analytics and log event, and you just basically pass in your key, and then anything that's within that bundle will end up being displayed through your analytics. Um, there is a little bit more that you can do with it using BigQuery, but it's not available for the free account. So if you do want to have the paid account, which I think is like five bucks a month, somewhere around there for the first one, um, you'll be able to do a little bit more with it as you're going along. Um, and then analytics events don't necessarily show up immediately as you're working with them in the console. So if you want to be able to print out the logs through your Android app in a terminal or either in the Android monitor, you can just run these commands out of the terminal and it'll actually log the events out. So you see what the commands are here, the ADB shell, set prop and so forth and logcat, and then it'll show up in your logs as that bottom portion. So you'll see what's actually being passed up and forth so you can make sure your analytics are working as you're going through your app and debugging. Um, so this, the next thing we're going to go over is crash reporting. So crash reporting is pretty much automatic. Um, if something does fatally crash your app, it will show up in your analytics as well as your crash reporting uh, section of the console. So you can see what's going on. So if you have your app out in the wild, like you can find out what users are doing to break your stuff. Because uh, it's always the user's fault. <laughs> um, any kind of caught exceptions that you have, you can go ahead and send up a log for that as well. So you can basically not crash the app on your user, but still know, know what's going on. So you can kind of catch any kind of errors that are going as well as just standard logs will show up there if you uh, want to push those up. So the examples we have here is if you just have a random exception that you catch, you can call Firebase crash report, pass in the exception, and it'll show up in that console later so you can see what's going on with your app and kind of keep track of it, as well as just any kind of Firebase crash log, which will also show up there. Um, <coughs> and this would be the screen that you would actually see those crashes on. So as you can see, I had a couple errors that I worked with. Um, I had a couple different devices that are on there, so you can see which users are being affected, what their devices are, and so forth. And then they actually put the different kinds of crashes into clusters, so you can see where things are related and how they're working. In each of the clusters, you can get more detail by just going to a section that's below that. Uh, it'll tell you generally where it's happening, what the issues are, and you can click into each of these to get even more detail. Um, so it'll tell you just the same kind of stuff you would see in Android Studio, where it says, here's where the actual crash was, this is what the issue was. And then below that, you can see what was the carrier for the user, manufacturer of their phone, what OS they're on, any kind of device-specific things. So if it's the Samsung Note, whatever is breaking on your app, you can see that and actually try to track one down so you can fix that issue. And this is actually something they just introduced with the, uh, the Dev Summit a couple months ago now. Um, they will email you whenever crashes happen, so you don't have to actually manually go into your console and check all the time whenever something's going wrong. It'll just let you know that it's happening. Uh, notifications, so GCM was kind of replaced with Firebase, so everything was moved into that. Um, so you have a console where you can just put in whatever content you want. You can also break that down to have different segments of your users based off analytics data or country or language and so forth. Uh, so you can send notifications based off of that and customize your experience for your users. So as you can see here, we have uh, segments. So anyone that is using my app and speaking English will get this. If I have a user with a French device, they'll get French and whatnot depending on whatever customization I want to send for my notifications. Uh, when your app is closed, everything is just all automatic when it's in the background. If uh, you just want to send it, it'll show up for them using whatever message you send. If your app is open, you have to have a Firebase messaging service, which will then receive the remote message, and then you can use a notification builder to create whatever content you want to have. So if your user does something in your app that will trigger this, you can do some customizations for them, just make it extra good for them. And then, of course, you just have to declare that service in your manifest. Oh, yep. Yeah. Does my app get notified so that I can actually 
some sort of a database of how many notifications there are? Uh, you don't have to. Is, is that notification, is that built automatically? Or do I have to write code that builds that notification? Um, out of the box, it works automatically. I haven't played around with it too terribly much to know if you can customize it for that stuff in the background. I would assume you can, just because there's so many things you would want to do with that situation. Right. Um, I haven't seen anything offhand for it, though. Okay. Yep. Cool beans. All righty. Um, yeah, and then just that notification when it is open, here's the custom one we built and just threw up on top there. Uh, so remote config is basically a way to uh, put in values online that you can access, uh, strings, int, so forth, that can be changed remotely. So if you have, um, as with the, I think one of the examples they give you is um, level difficulty for a game, if you want to change that, you can go ahead and do that remotely rather than having to update values inside of your app and then push out a new version to the Play Store, wait for people to actually download it, install it, and all that good stuff, you can just change this value uh, automatically and it'll work for them. Uh, you can also customize who is going to get these values. So if you want to test it out with 10 point whatever percent of your users, you can do that and just a random selection of them uh, with whatever parameters you're setting will get that new value so that you can test things with them, kind of check your analytics data and see what they're doing and so forth and see if it works out. If it doesn't, you don't need to send it to everyone. <coughs> so remote config, pretty straightforward to use. You just um, you can use the config settings to enable debug mode so it'll constantly pull rather than checking once every couple hours that it would normally do. Um, then you can set that. You set a default XML file. So if for some reason it can't reach the server the first time around, it'll have default values associated with your app. And then you can just call fetch and then have your completion listeners. If the fetch is successful, then you can say that fetch was done. You can call activated fetch and then do whatever you're gonna do with that value. So your defaults will just be a standard key value pair that you're gonna have in an XML file in your XML's resources folder. Uh, so here we just have an example of the default values that are there. And then once it succeeds on fetch, it updated those values and I just had to call the toast to show that it did change. Um, app invites is a part of the growing portion. Uh, so if you have a app and you wanna share it to other users, you know, like one user really likes it and they just wanna share it to their friends, you can use app invites um, setup of it to so create the intent. You can set messages and custom URL for images, call to action, and so forth. It'll allow users to email your app to friends or text message it and so forth. <coughs> um, one of the interesting things here too is if you have an iOS app also running on App Invites or Firebase, you can get the bundle ID for that app and then send that to your, their friends. So uh, if they have an Android phone themselves and they want to send to an iOS friend, their friend can install the iOS version of your app. That way they're not just limited to whatever platform you're building for at that time. Uh, so here's just kind of what the screen is. So uh, I just put in custom messages for the message text, the image, which is just gonna be your uh, GGG Boulder image here, um, title and so forth, and it'll just let them select whoever is in their contacts uh, and they can go through and see what they're working with and share it to their friends. Uh, one of the really cool things too is using the App Invite API from uh, Play Services is you can actually do deep linking so if an Android person shares to another Android friend, they can actually check the deep link of that, and you do some kind of custom a uh, action for them on first install, so they can get a reward for being uh, shared with their friend, or their friend can get a reward, some other stuff. Just kind of promote the idea of, hey, if you like this app, share it, and you'll get something out of it. Um, then there's just some general miscellaneous stuff. So ads is standard ads. Uh, they moved it into the Firebase packages. Uh, there's also app indexing, so if you have a website up and then somebody Googles you and they have your app already installed, you can do deep linking to it, that sort of thing. Uh, they also have dynamic links, which will shorten any kind of link and then pass that information in on analytics. So you can test any kind of campaigns that you have going on and make sure that, like see where people are clicking and where they're getting their information from and that kind of stuff, just to kind of track that thing. Uh, they will also do some general web hosting. So I haven't really played around with that too terribly much. I wanna say it's all through Node, but yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Analytics does support BigQuery, so you can do some more queries on it and just kind of make sure everything is working as you want, uh, see where people are using and so forth. And then there's Cloud Testing Lab, which is only available for Android. But what they let you do is with the paid account, you can create either virtual devices or access real devices to run your APK on, and it'll kind of run through different scripts for testing, see what crashes, what works, and so forth. And they charge you based off of the device hour. So if you use one hour, they'll charge you X amount. If you use half an hour, they'll charge you for half of that, that sort of thing. Um, and then all those test results are, star are stored in the Firebase console so you can access them and see what's going on. Um, as for additional resources, of course, there is the standard 
official docs. Um, YouTube is huge. They've just had the Dev Summit a couple months ago now. Um, totally worth it. They did a bunch of stuff in Berlin where they actually talked through everything in real good detail. Um, and then I built a demo app. So pretty much everything that I use here is in a demo app that you can grab off of GitHub. So if you just want to pull that down, put in your own JSON uh, Google services file and get that up and running, you can play around with it, break anything you want, actually play with it to see how it works, because that's kind of one of the best ways to learn. <laughs> so break everything you want. It's cool. Um, and then questions. Yep. Yeah, um, so what I ended up doing is with Android Things, they actually have it so you can import the file storage and some of the other um, Firebase libraries in there. So I was able to do it just like you would with the phone, but since it's on Wi-Fi, so like the Raspberry Pi and the Edison and all those can hook up over Wi-Fi, it'll just go ahead and let you send everything as you would from a phone. Can you just, can you just hit like a REST API though with the key? And um, possibly. I mean, you can make it work for web, so there may be a way to do it. I haven't played with it that much with IoT to see if that would work. Yep, uh, so it will support text as well. Um, I just spent in putting in all the properties and whatnot. When you put in all the X amount of properties, it'll just make it email only because it's exclusive. I think if you just use the message, it'll uh, send it out to either one. Yep. Have you tried using it with Amazon SMS? Um, SNS? Uh, for some of the switching services? Oh, um, a little bit. So what they actually have is a server AP or a server key that you can use and you just pass that to AWS or whatever <laughs> and it'll actually handle the GCM for you. So Uh, so they so yep. So they moved all the cloud messaging stuff to Firebase, and you can still grab that server key and press, put that in there, and it'll run through and do its thing. So, yep. Cool. Anyone else? Okie dokie. Okay. Cool. Thank you.